Yes, well, Marina, the, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for, for, for coming today. We're, we're very excited to hear your talk. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you to the, to the Palladium and the UCL Department of Greek and Latin for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, despite the title, I have to say that this lecture is not going to be a, a comprehensive or a complete overview of astronomical sources in Greek and Egyptian, because that would take us very long. Um, but however, what I'm doing right now is actually to complete uh, a chapter, a handbook chapter about Greek and demotic astronomical papyri. And there I am attempting to do a more or less comprehensive analysis within the scope of, of such a volume. So there will be a more comprehensive approach. What I've uh, decided to do today is to focus on some of the new finds that I've come across in my work uh, on astronomical papyri. And so I will present some thoughts and some reflections on the state of our knowledge. If you hear a beep in the background, there's construction going on next to me, so I don't know if uh, you can hear that, but there's nothing I can really do. Uh, that's why I'm wearing uh, earphones, so I apologize for that. Anyway, so since our time is limited, I will mainly focus on Egyptian, the Egyptian language side of things, because that's normally the, the lesser known area. But I will be making connections with Greek language material so that I don't keep you very long in this very fine summer afternoon or, or evening. So without further ado, let's let's start. So I'm going to start talking about the evidence that we have about astronomical practice in pharaonic Egypt before focusing on the Greco-Roman period, because I think that is very important to see the continuity in the practice of, of astronomy and actually what the evidence that we have to understand what was going on in Egypt is, because we can only see a very little window into what was actually going on. And this is going to condition very much how we evaluate and how we understand what the Egyptians were doing and how they uh, understood the heavens and the, the celestial bodies. So uh, I am going to list different types of, of evidence that we have, the main types of evidence. Um, and we always have to keep in mind that the observation of the heavens is attested around the Mediterranean and Near East since very early on. Uh, this is uh, something that is normally stated very, very often that people were fascinated with the sky and looking at the, the night sky, but it, it is true. Uh, we have astronomically aligned structures like Napta Playa in the Nubian Desert uh, going back to the 5th millennium BCE. And you can see an image of the reconstruction of this structure in the Nubian Museum in Aswan uh, on, in the image that you can see here on the left on my screen. And another famous example that has to be mentioned every time would be the pyramid complexes of the Old Kingdom with the, their orientation according to the cardinal points and with reference to different uh, areas of the sky and in particular with the northern area of the sky. So all these shows that the early Egyptians looked up to the sky and perceive the changes in celestial configurations and more importantly, their cyclical patterns. These observations led to the early development of different ways of measuring, especially the passing of time in different regions. And this is valid for the, the ancient world as a whole. So the development of different calendars and calendars that would take different celestial bodies as their main reference. We have solar calendars, we have lunar calendars, we have lunisolar calendars. So different ways of trying to measure time and then adapt social life to these different patterns. So mainly astronomy in the beginning is going to be focused on these calendrical uh, practices. If we focus on Egypt during the pharaonic period, we encounter plenty of evidence of astronomical practice of various kinds. And the first one that I've mentioned, as you can see here, is astronomically oriented monuments. And this second image, beautiful image of the Temple of Amun at Karnak. And this is during the winter solstice. And the, one of the axes of this temple was actually oriented to uh, the rising sun during the, the winter solstice. But we have uh, temples oriented to particular events in the, in the cycle of the sun, but also to particular stars. 
And this would depend also on the gods that were being worshipped in each area. Also, perhaps in many cases in combination with features of the landscape. So combination of what is going on on Earth and in the sky is going to determine what we see uh, in, these, in these constructions, in these monuments. Another piece of important evidence that we have uh, from Pharaonic Egypt are what we call astronomical diagrams. These are representations of star configurations, so constellations, what we would call constellations, the decans, and I will talk a little bit more about what the decans are, planets, and they're generally organized around, around the main areas of the northern and southern uh, sky. So, um, they're going to be grouped in, in particular areas which don't normally agree with the way we would represent the sky and sometimes we need to uh, think a little bit outside of how we can see the sky in order to understand what is going on. Uh, these are located on the ceilings of tombs and temples and uh, because of this very few have been preserved. We have more ceilings of temples but think that uh, more ceilings of tombs but think of uh, in the case of temples, the first part that is going to be destroyed is going to be the ceiling. So this is also going to limit the, the evidence that we have. We only have uh, one astronomical ceiling, one astronomical diagram from a temple, the temple of the Rameseum, but we can assume from the pharaonic period, I mean, but we can assume that there will be more. Um, they also appear on uh, the inner part of uh, sarcophagus and coffin lids and also on water clocks. And this is interesting because it connects again with this idea of the passing of time. Sometimes they will depict the entire sky and others are simplified versions of northern and southern skies. We have sometimes the goddess Nude, the goddess of the sky arch over the earth. And in the Roman period, in the Greco-Roman period, we will also find incorporation of the zodiac which is going to be grouped with all these elements that come from the pharaonic period. The earliest of these astronomical diagrams uh, comes from the tomb of Senmut, and this dates to the 15th century BCE, is the one that you can see here in the image, and notice how it's clearly divided into two parts. We have the northern sky here underneath, and the southern sky on top and the pictures of the planets. There are many elements here. This will be a complete representation of the sky. Here you have uh, the section of the northern sky from the tomb of Seti I, and you can see how constellations were depicted. You can see little dots representing stars, so it's uh, really interesting. But even though the first uh, complete uh, of these, complete one of these representations that we have dates to the New Kingdom, we know that this existed before. And if you look at this drawing that I have here, this is a section of a coffin, the coffin of Heni. And this is a coffin that dates back to the 11th dynasty. So we go back to the early Middle Kingdom. And here we have, it's, it's very uh, badly preserved here and it's, uh, uh, we only have access to uh, little sections here in this, in this uh, representation, but we can already see some elements like the northern constellations, uh, the star Sothis, so uh, Sirius. Nowadays, the constellation of Sag, Orion, the planets, Deccans. So we can assume that in the Middle Kingdom, these representations already existed and were incorporated to these kinds of materials. We can also look at later materials, for example, copies uh, in, papyri in papyrus from the Roman period that actually represent or copy texts that date back even to the Middle Kingdom. And we have a papyrus from Teptunis that seems to be a copy of the decoration of tombs in the region of Asiud, where we find uh, these sky representations. So even though we don't have so much evidence from the earlier periods, the Egyptians themselves were copying these representations sometimes over and over as a way of preserving their cultural memory. So we need to also look at later sources that might preserve what existed in earlier moments. We have many of these representations in the third volume of Egyptian astronomical texts, a massive publication of astronomical uh, documentation, documents by Neugebauer and Parker, we have 81 of these monuments with representations of astronomical diagrams. So there, there are many of them. 
We also have astronomical treatises, and the most interesting one is the so-called Book of Nud. This is a modern designation. The original title in Egyptian was Fundamentals of the Course of the Stars. This is first attested in the Australian of Abydos. This dates to the reign of Seti I. We are around the, the 13th century BCE. And it appears both in monuments and also on papyri. This papyri dates to the second century CE. Now, think about this. The first attestation that we have, 13th century BCE, and these copies in, on papyrus, second century CE. So these texts were really significant for the Egyptians. And these copies on papyrus are very interesting because they don't just copy the text, but they have commentary. So the Egyptians themselves were trying to understand what was going on with this text. And we know that at the time in which this text was copied uh, on the Australian, this was already an old text. Some of the writings are garbled. Some areas are, are already not understood. So according to some scholars like Joachim Quack, this could date to the old kingdom. Some other scholars think that it might be later. So perhaps second intermediate period, some scholars have said that it might be a composition from the new kingdom, but I think that at least probably middle kingdom. And the Egyptians were engaging over and over with, with these texts. And this is significant for us to ask why something like this would, would happen. I'm going to bring up these questions uh, more times throughout the, the lecture. Um, so as I say, you need to keep in mind that this is something that the Egyptians, the Egyptians themselves are considering as central for their understanding, not just of astronomy, but for their worldview. Let's continue with more evidence. Astronomical instruments. And here we have a very happy uh, confluence of material evidence. We have some of these instruments. Some of them might be what we could call ceremonial, so not actually instruments that would be used, but instruments that were created to be deposited in tombs, for example. But we also have text. So the image that you see here is a copy of a section of this book of Nut at the Osirian, in which we have the description of a sundial. And notice how it has indications also of the, the, different, the different measurements and it gives instructions on how it would be used. Now, this would be a dream for any ancient historian to get a handbook on how an instrument works. But actually, as scholars like uh, Sarah Simmons uh, has shown, um, it is not that clear how these instruments would be used because if you use it according to the instructions, considering how the, the instrument is actually made, uh, it wouldn't work. So this poses more questions about if we are missing some areas, how we should reconstruct the use of the instrument, or even if we're understanding the text correctly. So it's not easy to work with this kind of evidence, even if we have the material and the textual evidence together. And the last two uh, types of sources are actually the most interesting for my discussion today, since they are arranged in tabular form. The first one that I'm discussing are what we call diagonal star tables. You will also see them as diagonal star clocks, but since clocks is already making an assumption, table they are tables, so let's call them tables. I think that is more correct. I'm following uh, Siemens uh, here. And this one survived in 27 coffin lids from the early Middle Kingdom. So we're going uh, very far back in Egyptian history. And most of them come from the necropolis of Asiut. Uh, so you have to think of these lids um, being painted inside of the coffin. So it will be the ceiling, like the sky that the deceased would see from inside the, co the coffin. This is why uh, they are the equivalent of the ceiling of a tomb or of a, of a temple. Apart from these ones, we have one monumental example also from the Osirayan. Osirayan is a great source of, of these kind of materials for us. So it dates to the, to the New Kingdom, but most of the evidence dates to the, to the Middle Kingdom. The one in the Osirayan also has a different format. So what do we have here? On each table, what we have is a list of Deccan names. And these uh, Deccans are stars or groups of stars that would appear uh, rising in the east um, 
at a particular time. So starting with uh, sunset, we would see a star that then would move throughout the sky uh, during the night. And the same group of stars or star would rise first or would be visible first at sunset for a week. And an Egyptian week would be 10 days. So this is where this name decans comes from. And also once the zodiac is, in, is introduced, these decans would be incorporated to the system of the zodiac and each one will correspond to 10 degrees. So we have this uh, number 10 that is very pertinent for, for our modern name. This is the, the name that we have nowadays for, for these stars. So what we have here is a table that is recording these different decans and how they move throughout the sky. So the one that appears on the first hour, then it moves to the second hour, et cetera, et cetera, and with different dates. So then the next week, the, the decan that had risen uh, first would rise um, earlier, so it won't be visible. So they're going to move, and this is why we call them diagonal, because they're going to move in this. If, if you look at the table, you can see the same name of a deck, and I don't know if it's visible here, but you can see that it's placed in a diagonal fashion. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, because a talk could be just on these, on these tables, but you can see that this is already recording information that we would associate with more uh, precise astronomy with astronomy that is recording specific observations of the of the sky and keeping track of when they are taking place. Um, the order of the decans is consistent generally amongst the, the sources, but there are some differences. Uh, these tables were considered at first by scholars like Neugebauer and Parker as recording the decans at uh, how they were rising, so um, the, the rising in the east, but there seem to be two types of, of tables. So they seem to um, actually record not just the sunrise, but also the sunset. And this is very, very interesting because if we look at other types of astronomical sources later on, like uh, parapegmata in, in Greek astronomy, or you know, records of different events in the sky, sometimes one section of the sky, so the east, might be blocked by something, maybe clouds or something. So you might need to have a reference to what is happening in the west. So what, what is happening at, happening at sunset? So it makes sense that we will have these two different types of, of tables. Now, what is the interpretation of this? Why would you put these tables inside a coffin lid for no one to see except for the deceased? Another issue is many of these tables are not complete. So they will be useless. You wouldn't be able to use an incomplete table. So why? Why bother? Why to record this? These tables were interpreted as clocks, so as a way of telling time during the night. So you would look at what is visible in the east, and then you would be able to tell, oh, we are in this hour of the night. Now, the problem with this is that the movement, the sky doesn't move in such an ideal fashion. It's not that easy. And actually, a decan that rises at some point is not going to set at the same point. So if we have an order of decans, the order in which they're going to rise and they're going to set is not going to be the same. So it doesn't work so well. So why do we have these representations? You wouldn't be able to use them so seamlessly as, as clocks in many cases. Uh, one of the, the interpretations that have, has been proposed is that these are actually almanacs that what they do is to record the appearance of the sky at different points. And think about the context. Context is very important. This is a funerary context in which the deceased is trying to join the stars. So this would be sort of like a map. It's a way of allowing the deceased to join his or her place in the, in the sky. So not so much as a tool for measuring time, but a representation of the sky in movement. If we look at this table, what we see is the sky and how it moves at different types of the year throughout, throughout the night. So I think that this is an explanation that takes, uh, takes in also the context in which we find these tables. Now, and something that I will highlight 
later also, these are monumentalized versions of tables that might have existed in papyrus to be used in a different way by astronomer priests. We have to keep in mind that the versions that we have of these tables are all monumental. It's as if I take a particular document and I create a plaque and I put it in a building and to commemorate it. It's not meant to be used. It's just a commemoration. So the fact that we have these incomplete tables is uh, making up for the presence of the table, but not making them as usable uh, tools. And we find this also with religious texts. Sometimes a religious text is all garbled. There's not even complete, but its presence acts magically as if it were complete. So we need to think of what the context is. Context is always very important. And the next uh, type of evidence is another tabular uh, form, this Ramesside star clocks, in which we see um, a similar kind of table um, with, um, with different stars here that we don't have decans. And these appear only, we have only four instances limited to three royal tombs in the 20th dynasty. They don't appear later. And what we have here is a set of 24 identical tables, each one corresponding to a 15 day time period, so half a month. And all seem to come from the same original data. So there must have been a master copy and then these were put in the ceilings of the tombs. Here in the image, you can see how these tables are located here on the side of the passage of this, of this tomb. And this is a close up. So what do we have? We have 13 rows of text. The first one corresponds to the beginning of the night. And then we have uh, one row for each one of the 12 hours of the night. And then we have um, uh, a star and its location with respect to a reference figure. So it is on top of the head of the reference figure, on top of the one shoulder, the other shoulder. And an interesting thing here is that some of the grids go over the figures, but in cases like this, the figure is over the grid and sometimes it's obscuring where the stars go. So they, they wouldn't be usable either. And sometimes the information that we get here is contradicted by how it's represented here. So again, difficulties in how we should uh, use this. Uh, another controversial element is how we should think that these were used. Where is this reference figure located? Is it located against the southern sky? How, what do we take as the position of the, of the figure to create all these different, different measurements? So again, these documents are problematic and once more, they are monumental. So summing up this, this part of my, of my lecture, what we have here in this evidence from the pharaonic period is observational astronomy at the origin. We see that the Egyptians were observing the sky and taking notes, but we have also idealized versions. Some of these documents might take observational evidence and then adapt it to an idealized version of how the sky should work and think that we are in a religious context in which many elements that might not be good, that might be elements of chaos are adapted and are, are meant to conform to an ideal of, of order. So one question that comes up is what was the use and purpose of these, of these tables? Now I've already highlighted that the diagonal star tables might register either time or changes in the sky and it's really hard to determine what the right answer is for the monumental versions and for the original versions that might have existed on papyrus. With the Ramesside star clocks, we also have these kind of issues. And when we analyze them, we also need to keep in mind our own modern bias. When we talk about science and about astronomy, we normally think about accuracy. So we want to be accurate. We want to have data that conforms to what is right, what is actually happening in the sky. And this might not have been the main concern in the creation of some of these tables. So we need to detach ourselves of our way of looking at science. Uh, we focus sometimes on just the strict astronomical knowledge that is connected to these documents, sometimes disregarding the very important religious component that they have. And don't forget that we are in a funerary and temple context for 
all these all these sources and that's definitely going to condition how we look at them as i've said these are monumentalized versions of the original sources so we don't know what the the sources that might have been used in daily astronomical practice might have been and we don't have the counterpart, these manuscripts of these practical versions of these, of these tables. Throughout my presentation, I've included these little boxes with some bibliographical references in case you want to expand on what I'm, what I'm saying. So this is um, a very interesting article that questions some of these interpretations of the, the sources that we have seen. So um, it's a very important, in my opinion, contribution to trying to push aside our, our assumptions. All right, so what is, having seen what happens in the, in the Pharaonic period, what is the place of Egypt in the history of ancient astronomy? If we look at the history of ancient astronomy as a whole, what have historians of science said? So due to these kinds of, of materials that were available during the Pharaonic period, as well as the, the few materials that were available in Egyptian for the Greco-Roman period earlier on, some very relevant historians of the history of astronomy like Otto Neugebauer consider that Egypt had no role to play in the history of astronomy. Um, he thought that knowledge of especially mathematical astronomy was developed in Mesopotamia during the first millennium and it was transmitted directly to the Greco-Roman world and Egypt was just on the side during doing you know their own religious thing in their temples without developing an astronomy that would be of any importance now the incorporation of astronomical knowledge is fundamental for the development of astronomical practice so learning how this mesopotamian knowledge gets to the greco-roman world is really important because from the greco-roman world is going to develop all the way until the present so if we want to see what the, this chain of transmission is, we need to look at these sources closely. Elements that were transmitted from Mesopotamia were, amongst others, the zodiac, and the zodiac as a very important element, as the framework to track the positions of the two luminaries, the sun and the moon, and the planets is going to give us the ruler against we're going to me measure movement. So it's not only going to be relevant for astrological practice, but for these mathematical astronomy and also the incorporation of various arithmetical schemes that were calculated in Mesopotamia from observations in order to be able to predict the movement of the celestial bodies. All these are going to be developed in Mesopotamia and will be incorporated to the Greco-Roman world. Now in recent decades some scholars have challenged this view that Egypt had no role to play in this history of development and I've cited here two, two quotes from two relevant scholars here. Um, the first one is from Alexander Jones, already in 1994, in uh, an article that I'm citing completely here on the place of astronomy in, in Roman Egypt, he questions that idea of Mesopotamian knowledge going directly into the, the Greek world and positioning Egypt, perhaps, as the center in which this transmission took place. I think that so we will see most of our astronomical evidence in terms of tables comes actually from Egypt. These are Egyptian papyri. So we shouldn't forget that even though they're written in Greek language, we need to see them in the context in which they were written and put against uh, other sources, in this case, in Egyptian language, which is what I'm going to be doing today. Um, so there's the question of, do we have Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and by Greece, I mean the Greco-Roman world, so the Greek-speaking world. And Joachim Quack, in, a, in another article, uh, which I reference here, also brings up the importance of Egypt and not just Egypt as Alexandria, which is what we normally think about for uh, Hellenistic Egypt, but also the Egyptian uh, Hora, so the, the Egyptian... Uh, the rest of Egypt, we would say the Egyptian temples, has played a very important role in this transmission. And during this talk, I hope to show you some evidence of this transmission through Egypt and through the Egyptian-speaking world. 
So a very important step in our knowledge of both Egyptian and Greek language astronomy took place in 1999 and was developed by Alexander Jones in these two very important publications. I'm going to say very important many times, but they are really very important. Um, Alexander Jones uh, published the astronomical papyri from Oxyrhynchus, which added a very great amount of astronomical sources to what we had before. And it actually allowed him to create a classification of astronomical tables and to start understanding what was going on. We had a classification for Mesopotamian text, which was mainly developed by, by Neuke Bauer, but his work was fundamental for our understanding of Greek astronomical tables. This is the description, the classification that he gave in these two publications. On the one side, we have tables and also non-tabular astronomical texts. And you can see here the main types that he was able to identify with. There's always an others because there are always uh, some uh, tables that are not that easy to classify or they're just one example. But in general, most of them accommodate to these uh, different um, categories. Tables are all from the Roman period, to give you a chronological idea, and non-tabular texts already appear in the Hellenistic period. The earliest astronomical tables are not earlier than the last decades of the, of the first century BCE, and the latest uh, are from the mid-fifth century CE. Most of the material, though, corresponds to the second to the fourth century, but this might also be related to the chances of, of preservation, since other kinds of papyri also survive mainly from that period. So it's not just astronomical text. Um, just to give you a, a brief idea of what these tables are about, we have first this epoch uh, tables, and these are a list of successive occurrences of a specific kind of event in the, in the movement of a celestial body over an interval of years. And these could be events in the synodic cycle of a planet, dates of slowest motion for the moon, solstices for the sun, etc. Uh, templates, the next kind is a tabulation of day-by-day -day progress of a heavenly body. And we, it has the time and the longitudinal, longitudinal progress. Uh, mentioned from a particular epoch. So these events that I've mentioned before for the epoch tables, ephemerides, day-by-day -day positions, um, almanacs give us, so we have almanacs of different kinds. The ephemerides are uh, one of them. So registration of different positions for either all the planets, etc. I'm not going to go in detail, but you can see that they cover basically everything that you would need to be able to calculate where a planet is at a particular point. And we will see later why they were doing this. Non-tabular texts uh, have um, go from theoretical texts that describe um, elements of astronomy, instructions for the creation of the tables, predictions of different phenomena. So for example, eclipse canons in which we have a description of how an eclipse is going to take place, so where obscurity is going to start happening, where the moon is going to be. And horoscopes are basically their own category. Sometimes they look a little bit tabular. I just put them there, but they're in a very important category. We have many of them, both in Egyptian and in Greek. Now, what do we actually have in Egyptian language? Because we have many tables in Greek, but what is actually the amount of uh, Egyptian material that we have? is not that much according to the last classification of Egyptian material. And I want to thank Alexander Jones here for sharing with me his last version of the complete table of astronomical uh, papyri. He has one in his book of 1999, but he's preparing the publication of an article that will include an updated table. This is basically what we have. And I've highlighted in, in blue the types that are represented in the Motic. Yellow are papyri that are still not edited, that either Alexander Jones is publishing with other scholars, Joachim Quag is working with him on some of these. Um, I am working on some of these too, but this is basically what we have. You see, we have an epoch table, one template. For kinematic tables, we have tables of computed CCGs. Two are published, 
two are being edited at the moment. I'm working on, on one of them. Almanacs, we have a little bit more. You see that we have one ephemeris, sign entry almanacs, we have three. One of them is still not published. Monthly almanacs, we have one, and I'm working on the publication of these tiny fragments of what might be the same. And uh, other tables, we have this P. Kalsberg 9. And then non tabular, we have two procedure texts and one eclipse canon. So we don't have, and we have many horoscopes. Horoscopes, we have plenty. So we don't have that much. And this is a problem, of course, because we lack comparanda. But the benefit, the, the, the good thing of the multi-material is that the formats of the tables are the same. And in some cases, truly identical to those in Greek. So we can use the material in Greek to study the demotic material and the demotic material to complement what we have in Greek. So we actually need to bring everything together. So it's a small sample, but it shows that Egyptian language astronomy was happening at all levels. At least we have a very wide representation of all these tables. I'm going to focus now on three of these tables. Uh, this peak verse 639, and I will say just a few words about this one, peak verse 638, and the Montserrat Papyrus 314. And I'm doing this because, well, first of all, because I published the Montserrat Papyrus and it's very dear to my heart and it's very interesting, but especially because these three papyri have the same hand, so they come from the same context. One step that we need to do at this point is also to try to relate all these sources and see which ones come from the same places and what context of practice of astronomy we might have here. Here you can see this is 638. And this is the Montserrat papyrus. You can see that the color is the same for the papyrus. They're very yellowish. They're very distinctive. They have this very dark ink. The hand is, is the same. I'm not showing this one, 639, because I'm still working on it. So it's still not published. And it's a problem about showing unpublished material. But this is a table of CCGs that is quite complex too. But I think that we have enough with this uh, for today. So... I'll focus now on these papyrus of Montserrat to show you how just with a very fragmentary table, we just have this fragment, we can learn quite a lot about the, the Egyptian language astronomy, but also in general, how just with these little fragments, we can learn much. Um, and, you know, it's worth editing new material because they can contribute quite a lot to what we, to information that we have. So this is the, the table I'm going to focus just to show you uh, the elements that we have on the second column. And this is a, a monthly almanac. What we have here is the 12 months. And we have the uh, position of particular planets at each point in the month. This is Jupiter, this is Mars. and if we don't have a transition from one sign, one zodiac sign to the other, what we have is the position on the first day of the month. This is why we have day one repeated uh, many times. The positions are given in a lot of detail. So we don't have just the zodiac sign, but we have longitudes with degrees and minutes. But not only that, we also have these phrases that you see here, and these are events in the synodic cycle of the planet. So we have here in Egyptian language, the most complex monthly almanac, kind of monthly almanac that we also had attested in Greek. So this very advanced kind of astronomy was also being practiced in Egyptian language at this point. This uh, is a table that dates um, the movement of the planets at the end of the first century, but was probably written during the, the second century. This is another table. This is one of the Oxyrhynchus papyrus. And I'm bringing it here just to show you that it has the exact same format as the Montserrat table. It has the 12 months, then the days within the month, then the position, the zodiac sign. We have degrees and minutes. So a very specific, very precise positioning. And then we have 
events in the in the synodic cycle of the planet. So the first station, the chronicle rising, second station, this is uh, uh, first visibility. So we have the same kind of data and coincidentally is the same section in the synodic cycle of Jupiter in both tables. This just corresponds to the earliest cycle. In this case, we are in 1211 BC. In the case of the Montserrat table, we are around 80 years later. So. Uh, in the next cycle of, of Jupiter. If we compare them just to show you the parallel, these are the two papyri, and in the transcription, we can see that we have the same, and you can see that the first station is happening in the same month, the chronical rising in the same month. So we have basically the same kind of information being written in both languages, and therefore the same kind of astronomy being practiced. Now, if we compare the tables that we have in the Motic, uh, when we have different examples of the same kind of table. In this case, we have two almanacs, the monthly almanac of Montserrat and the sign entry almanac of the, the Stobart tables. We can also see that we have similar information. In this case, this movement of, of Jupiter is represented here too. And this one corresponds to the exact year. So this is the fifth year of Vespasian. And is recording very similar information. Notice how in the month for day two, we have entry in Jupiter in Scorpio. And here we have the same month for day six, entrance in, in Scorpio. For the, the ninth month, we don't have the units here, but it's within the, the teens. So we have here 16, this might be 16 too, is not very well preserved, and then for the month 12, again, entry in Scorpio. So we don't know if this might come from the same original material to create this, these two tables. It seems to be calculated using the same, the same kind of algorithm. And what we see here that is different, that of course, we have more information in this papyrus table, but think of the context. The Stobar tablets are tablets that need to be carried by the astrologer and they're very small. So we just have the essential data for many years. For a, a, a very, and we have different tablets here. We have four preserved, but they would be more originally. So just month, day, and zodiac sign have been written here, but probably originating in the same kind of very detailed uh, source. By the way, this was available to Neugebauer, but because it's so simple, it led him to this conclusion that Egyptian astronomy was not so developed as Greek astronomy. We can see that this is not true. We have the same level of complexity in Egyptian tables. Other things that we learn in this very small papyrus is terminology, vocabulary. Until now, we had terminology for the synodic cycle of the planets in Near Eastern languages, in Akkadian. We had it in Greek, but we didn't know it in Egyptian. Now we have the terminology for first visibility, per mehuan, so the first exit or the first uh, appearance. The first station, aha mehuan, so the first standing in place. And a chronicle rising, and this is the one that is very intriguing, because a chronicle rising, which corresponds to the opposition of the planet, when the planet rises at the same time as the sun is setting, is designated as the 15th day or the festival of the 15th day, and that's the full moon. Of course, the full moon is in opposition to the sun. So we see here that the Egyptians are using lunar terminology for the synodic cycle of the planets. And this might raise the question of maybe the planets have a, a stronger presence in pharaonic period astronomy, which hasn't been recognized because we had been connecting it to lunar references and perhaps it referred to the planets. And I'm thinking here of the Book of Nut in particular and the contested section on the planets that has been connected to the moon. It might effectively be referring to the planets oh, using yeah. some lunar terminology. Oh, so this might be... Um, uh, I think that there's, there's one microphone that is activated. Um, so, okay, let's, let's continue here. Uh, he, with all this evidence, we can uh, talk about the transmission of astronomical knowledge. So how is knowledge transmitted? We need the results, use of specific terminology. So 
going back, <laughs> uh, we have the, the we have to look at how the knowledge is transmitted. So we have more evidence now to play with. Now, at, uh, assessing how knowledge is transmitted is really complicated because sometimes we can arrive to the same conclusions independently and in some context, some cultures can arrive independently to the same conclusions. Hoffman in this article that I referenced here gave some clues as to how we should do this. We can, we have to examine the methodology. So the methods that are applied and not the results, you can arrive to the same result, but you can use different methodology. If the methodology is exactly the same. This methodology might have been transmitted, but have, might have moved from say Mesopotamia to Egypt or to the Greco-Roman world. And also the use of specific terminology or elements that are uh, aleatory. So signs or symbols. It's very hard that a symbol that is uh, just chosen randomly is going to be the same. And we're going to look at some evidence here. So the sign for zero. Uh, in astronomical papyri in Greek, there's a sign that is used to indicate zero when we have zero degrees or zero minutes in giving longitudes. And this is, this is what it looks like. This is a table from Alexander Jones's edition of the astronomical papyri from, from Oxyrhynchus. And you can see how it looks like a horizontal line and a little dot, or sometimes with a little tick here, sometimes it has an element on top. So there's some variations to it. Now, if we look at the symbol that is used for zero in the demotic tables, we see something that looks very similar. Hoffman already in 2004 5 published an article in which he proposed that this symbol that is used in peak house for 32 to indicate zero might be the same as the one used in Greek tables. Now, if we look at the papyrus of Montserrat, we see that it looks even more similar to what we have in Greek papyri, and it seems confirmed that this is in fact the same symbol. Now, what is this symbol? This is a demotic word, is the demotic word for empty the absence of a, of a quantity. So if the sign for zero used in Greek papyrus is a demotic sign, this will probably indicate that these Greek papyri have gone through demotic in order to incorporate this symbol. And perhaps that these tables are made by the same people, they're using the same conventional symbols. We have even more interesting things. If we look at the papyrus of Montserrat, we have a secondary use for the sign for zero, which doesn't correspond to just indicating an empty place in degrees and, and minutes. Notice how we have a zero in the middle of degrees and minutes in all these entries. In all the instances in which degrees or minutes are not zero, we find this symbol here. And this seems to replicate the use of the cuneiform sign, the sign that we have in, in Mesopotamian tablets for separation, which is the same as the sign for zero in Mesopotamian tablets. So are here demotic tables borrowing a use directly for, from Mesopotamia? Perhaps. We also have the use of other symbols in the Stobar tablets, like the, the sun disk to indicate separation. And the use is not exactly the same. So in Mesopotamian tablets, this is only used in places where there could be some ambiguity. So where, where degrees are 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50, and then minutes are one to nine. So to avoid reading it as just one number and separating them. In the case of the Montserrat papyrus, it's in every case. So there are differences. So the question remains open, but it's interesting that we can make this connection. In Greek astronomical tables, I'm only aware of one papyrus, P oxy 4136, in which we find this use doesn't appear in general. So in this case, of course, this is only one papyrus in Montserrat, but there are many instances. So anyway, this is an open question. Another sign that is interesting here is the sign used for first and last visibility in Greek astronomical papyri, which is the one that you see here. And I'm just giving you this one as an example of how it appears in the papyrus. We don't know what it is. Alexander Jones calls it the loop because it looks like a loop, but that's all that we can say. But if we go to the papyrus of Montserrat, first visibility is indicated as this. So this is pair, so to come out. 
MEF1, so first, first visibility. If we look at the sign for pair in other demotic text, it takes this shape that you can see here, right? So my proposal here is that this sign is also borrowed from the sign used in astronomical tables in the motif, which would give us another element that goes from the motif into Greek astronomical tables. So that's in terms of transmission. Before I move on, I just wanted to show you an, a closer image of uh, Papyrus Kalsberg 638 another one of this same group. This is a lunar ephemeris. It gives uh, the position of the moon uh, throughout a series of consecutive days. And you can see that it just gives you zodiac sign and in this case, just uh, degrees. It doesn't give so much information. But Alexander Jones was able in, the, in this publication to connect this to the, lun to the standard lunar scheme, which is a way of calculating the motion of the moon uh, that comes from Mesopotamia. So here we see the incorporation of these Mesopotamian methods into uh, an Egyptian language papyrus, which makes it very, very interesting. Now, this date that he proposed might need to be revised, uh, considering the date of the Montserrat papyrus, but this will be for a different talk and for the, and for the future. Now, another question that we have with these traditions, do we have an astronomical tradition in Egypt or should we be talking about different traditions in different locations in Egypt? And what is the evidence for this? I've created this table here to show you the symbols that are used in different tables. So in the Stobart tablets, just for the Zodiac, we have these symbols that you see here. Uh, this is uh, one of the sign entry almanacs in the Motic, and you see here the symbols. You can see that some are similar, but others are not. Um, you can see, for example, for Gemini, in this case, it's a double sign. Here is a single sign. Some of them are more uh, hieratic looking. Uh, others uh, use a symbol that derives from the Motic. This is from the Montserrat papyrus, and this is from the Athribis horoscopes. Now, the symbols that are being used are not consistent throughout Egypt. So we should ask if there are actually different schools that are acting at the same time. And this is going to move me, and I know that I'm going over time, and this is going to move me to the last part of my lecture today. And that is the purpose of the astronomical tables. Now, why do we need all these very complex mathematical tables. What was the purpose of all this? Well, it might sound uh, weird to us nowadays, but the whole purpose of all this was prediction, was the creation of horoscopes, was um, the prediction, not of the future, but actually what prediction means at this point, as you can see from, from this quote from Alexander Jones, is the deduction of uh, the movement of or the situation, the, the configuration of the sky according to a series of, of rules. So what these tables were used was to create the horoscopes of people that would, you to the, would go to the astrologer and say, I was born in this day at this hour of the night. What, was, what did the sky look like at that point? And then according to that celestial configuration, that would explain the life of that individual. So all these tables were needed to create basically horoscopes. So the other side of all this material is the horoscopic material, which is something that should be studied together with the astronomical tables. The main edition of Greek horoscopes is this one, this book, Greek horoscopes by Neugebauer and uh, Van Huesen, but this has increased since 1959. We have more Greek horoscopes. And in the case of demotic horoscopes, this is what we have right now. Uh, there's always fewer material. There are also more Greek philologists than demotic philologists. So we're a little bit behind, but we are progressing at a nice pace, I would say. So right now we have, according to a, a recent census, 60 horoscopes in the Motic that come from 49 Ostraca. All the Motic horoscopes come from Ostraca and three funerary decorations. Uh, these are the locations. I'm not going to go into detail, but 
the interesting thing is that we can add more to this. I have recently published an article incorporating a new set of horoscopes to this group. One of these unprovenance horoscopes that appear in this list now has a provenance. Is this one from the Ashmolean that comes from a threebies. And we have more horoscopes coming from a threebies. And this is a compilation of, from the news. You might have heard about uh, 18,000 ostraca that were found in recent campaigns at the site of Athribis in Middle Egypt. Now I think that there are around 20,000, so many thousands of, of ostraca, and uh, a bunch of them are uh, horoscopic. They have astrological content, and these are the ones that I've been working on. This is one of them, is actually the most complete one that we have in the whole group, and it contains three horoscopes. You can see here a better image. And this is my facsimile where I have separated the three tapes. So it has three horoscopes with little side notes that include the name and the provenance of the, of the native. Um, this is um, the, the transliteration and translation of what we have. And these are actually very detailed horoscopes. They're also the earliest group of horoscopes that we have from Egypt in both Egyptian and, and Greek language. And already at this point, and we are very early in the, in the change of the, of the area. So at the end of the first century BCE, beginning of the first century CE, we have a lot of information that is also astronomically relevant. So we have first the date, so the date of birth of the native. We have the entry for the sun, and we have a zodiac sign degree and term ruler. This is the first time that we have the system of terms, the Egyptian system of terms attested. So from very early on, these have astrological significance. I know that there's a lot of information. I cannot go in detail uh, to all of it. We have a lot of information for the moon, including a lunar date. Um, that correlates with some tables that we had in Papyrus Kalsberg 9 and another Greek papyrus, data for the five planets, but also the position of the, of the stars at that point. So we have um, the constellation that was rising at that point, but also the, the location of all the constellations of the zodiac at the moment of the, of the birth. Um, through the study of this ostracon, I was able to identify the origin of that ostracon from the Ashmolean that had been published by Neuke Bauer and Parker. It's this one here. You can see a modern photograph of it. And my facsimile has the same exact form, uh, format and probably the same hand. It clearly belongs to the, to the same group. So now we know that it belongs to, it comes from a threebies. And I was able to re-edit it. And this is a significant improvement from what we had from Neugebauer and Parker. But think that this is an incomplete horoscope and they only had one. So they were playing with the information that they had. So as a conclusion for these horoscopes, this, are, this is the earliest group from Egypt. And it's not just these two horoscopes. I've been able to give a three bit an origin to a set of other horoscopes that are also at the Ashmolean. I contacted the curator at the Ashmolean and, it, and he told me that there were other Ostraka that had accessed the collection at the same time as the one that Neugebauer published. And having seen all of them, they are also from the same group. So this brings up a very important group of horoscopes from a very important region uh, for, the, for our knowledge of ancient astrology. There are more from Athribis that have appeared and I will edit all of them in a monograph uh, of all these, all these Athribis materials. They have a very complex structure since very early on, as I have said, the Egyptian system of term rulers already appears, entries for the moon with a lot of detail, and there are other astrological elements that are very relevant. And getting to the conclusion, um, I have many conclusions, but I want to summarize them in a uh, very few points. I want to highlight the importance of the addition of new materials, and especially the motive. You have seen just with the Montserrat papyrus how much new information it has given us. So it is a priority to focus on the addition of new materials, so that we have a good corpus from which to draw conclusions. This is what led Alexander Jones to be able to do the classification of Greek material. Greek and demotic astronomical papyri need to be studied together. They shouldn't be independent 
sets of, of materials, but they should be seen as part of the same group. And we have seen that they have many uh, elements that are the same in terms of format, of symbols used, and astronomical and astrological texts also should be seen as two sides of the same whole. And when we look at symbols, the symbols that are used in the astronomical tables need to be compared with those in the horoscopes because the people using the tables are the same people creating the horoscopes. So we are in the same, in the same context. Now, open questions. There are still many things that we don't know. How did Babylonian astronomical knowledge reach Egypt and when? Uh, we know that uh, scholars were moving around already early on in the first millennium, even in the Neo-Assyrian period, we know of Egyptians being in, in those royal courts and later on. So how did this transfer take place and in which language form? What was the identity of the astrologers or identities? Do we have astrologers in the temples and then independent astrologers outside, perhaps only working in Greek language? Um, were the Egyptian priests making the first translations of those demotic tables into Greek that then would circulate outside of the temples? There's still a lot to be, to be known. Perhaps we will never know some of these uh, issues. And can we identify different regional traditions in the practice of both astronomy and astrology? Are the differences that we see both in the horoscopes and in the tables um, different ways of working with this material. So I'll have to leave this open. And thank you very much for your attention. I know that I've gone way over time, but I hope that this uh, presentation was interesting and that it made you think about all these topics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. That was, fa that, that was, that, that was fabulous. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, consider that we've given you a, a, a very strong round of applause. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I guess. I, shall, shall, shall we? Uh, shall we start the discussion? We, we have a. We have. We, we have. We have some time. Um, so uh, yes. Do, do, does does anyone have a question or something to say? I feel like I've, I've been overwhelming everyone with a bunch of data. <laughs> I, I, I suppose I, if, if, if it's all right, then, then perhaps I'll start. I, 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 was, I was fascinated by these, these, these early, uh, the, these early, early images of the, of the, of the, of the night sky and, 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 the, and the constellations on, on the, on the, uh, the ceilings and especially the insides of the coffin, coffin the coffin lids. And I was, <laughs> I was, I was, I was wondering, uh, uh, you know, if you could say a little more about <clears throat> about the, what the, what what the cultural meaning of those representations might have been. I mean, is it are we looking at something like the like the Greco-Roman uh, notion of of, of catastrophism, the idea that the the idea that the the soul will find its place among the stars? Are we looking at at perhaps at, at a very some sort of very early kind of kind of astrological representation of the of the, uh, of, of, the, of the destiny of the individual, or is it something else completely different? Well, that's, it's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's uh, what we need to look at is uh, at the text that appear in, in this same context. So in this case, funerary text, if we look at the coffin text and the pyramid text, we see that especially in the, in the pyramid text, there's a very st strong focus on an afterlife that is connected to the stars. In that mm -hmm. case, it refers only to the king because mm -hmm. the text that we have basically belong to kings and to the members of the royal family. But the deceased, in this case, the king is going to join the gods in the, in the stars. Um, it's not exactly like what we have in Greek. So mm -hmm. it's not going to constitute like a new constellation or to mm -hmm. provide an explanation, uh, but the king would be part of the entourage of, uh, of the gods that are seen in the sky. And even in the Greco-Roman period, if we look at the ceiling of Dendera, we see these depictions of gods sailing in boats uh, through the sky. So this would be the, the destiny of, of the deceased. Um, so the interpretation that has been proposed that I, I referred to and that I, I really like is that the deceased would use this as a map to, okay, where is my place? So yeah. I don't know, this is uh, speculation, like which part of the sky should I, should I join? But, you know, uh, there's 
not that much that we that we know to be able to fully to fully explain them but i think that that interpretation um, makes makes sense at least at least to me uh thank you thank you uh yeah we have a question from uh from karen nimali at johns hopkins hi um can you hear me Yes. Can you see me? I, I, I can't see myself and I can't hear myself. So I'm <laughs> in the dark here. Marina, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I, I, I love it to see you um, as always. Um, can I ask a little bit about, um, I'm very interested in what you were saying about the monumentalization of these papyri, these kind of live text. And that got me wondering about the materiality of them and the substances used and even down to the colors and the pigments and I was wondering uh, if anybody is, is that is there any mileage is there any interest is there any significance in the kinds of materials used to convert these papyri into more monumental texts um, yeah well, the, the colors are always important and uh -huh. in Egyptian, uh, sometimes even if the if a material is not used, if the same color that the material has is employed is referring to the material, lapis lazuli is associated with the sky, is used sometimes to make uh, pigments and we see blue associated, of course, to, to the sky and not just to the sky, but the idea of a watery expanse because the sky is also connected to this expanse of water and we see this idea of sailing so the blue color is going to be important of course we we would enter into the discussion between green and blue and if there is actually a distinction we will also see some um use of of colors that we would designate as as green but is there's this also there are also implications in this uh, use of these colors that connect with funerary ideas uh, this greenish, bluish color is watch, and that's also a term that in Egyptian means to be new, to be fresh, and it's connected to the renewal. So it's also a color oh. that uh, has those connotations of what the deceased would would want for that's for the cool. afterlife. So yeah. there are all these all these connections, but the monumentality of these or the monumentalization of these kinds of sources is, is very is very important. It's very important for us to keep in mind because we don't have the counterpart. And actually it, it is because we have very few temple libraries. In fact, we only have really one complete temple library and it's the one of the Tunis. This is why we have so much demotic material from the second century uh, CE. We have other papyri earlier on, but we cannot evaluate it in the same way as we can when we have uh, a library of a temple. These libraries from the pharaonic period haven't survived, so we don't know which kind of materials and actual practical sources that would, would be used in the daily practice of astronomy would have been kept in the in these libraries. We have references to books. The Egyptians in their texts reference uh, other texts, so we have these cross references. But in most cases, we don't have those books, so we don't know what the, the specific contents would have been. Thank you so much, Marina. Thanks. Uh, I have a question here in the chat from Kata Jasper, uh, who asks uh, whether there is an explanation for why most early Middle Kingdom star clocks or star tables are associated with the cult, with the cult center of Asyut and not with another cult center. Um, I think that in many cases is due to uh, issues of preserva preservation. We have more more coffins from these from these areas, but if we look at later materials, some areas might have traditions that emphasize the use of some documents. In the case of this very early material, we just need to keep in mind that we just don't have that much that much material. So it really depends on what has been what has been preserved. Mm. Thank you. And I, I'd like to call on uh, your uh, Professor Clark, uh, who has a question or some yeah. comment. Hello, good evening, Marina. Many thanks for your presentation. And Thank you. I have one somewhat longer and one short remark. The longer one is about these 
um, diagonal tables um, because they form a smaller part of my still unpublished habilitation thesis on the Egyptian deacons. I really hope to finish it this year, but so far I've hoped that every year it always it <laughs> has not come out. I will try to make it real this time. In anyway, in that book, I propose a different idea for the um, meaning uh, because I also link them with the funerary concepts, but in a different way. Um, the point where I go in is the fact that for the night before the burial, the nightly vigils were important and they were structured into the 12 hours of the night. And obviously you need some tool to tell the hours during the night. And such a star clock is one of the more obvious means to do so. So my proposal is that these star clocks are so to say a depiction of what was really used during the um, funerary rituals. So that's my proposal, which is quite a bit different from the other ones, but probably also just hypothetical. <laughs> and that was a longer remark. The shorter one is about papyri from temple libraries. There might be one very small 26th dynasty um, astronomical fragment from Elephantine that's also going to be published in my habilitation thesis. It's just about deacon names and then some sort of distance indications. I'm not too sure what it is about, but it clearly looks astronomical and is quite different from what we have otherwise about the deacons. So that might be an interesting hint about what was really going on with the stars during the late period. That's absolutely excellent. Thank you very much. I'm really, really looking forward to the publication of your Abiel Shrift. It's going to be a, a great contribution to our knowledge. So, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, S.C. Peterson. Uh, hi, uh, my question, and, and I should preface this by saying I'm, I'm uh, a bit out of the uh, classical archaeology realm for a while, having uh, switched over maybe 25 years ago uh, to American archaeology. But I guess my question is, I understand that uh, in many of the monumental and funerary representations, accuracy of the star charts and, and, and planetary uh, positions may not necessarily have been accurate or nor intended to be uh, extremely accurate. But I wonder if, uh, in general, if anyone has gone and checked the positions to, to check the accuracy of some of the other texts to find out, you know, uh, how accurate their observations and the recordings are, and if this demonstrates, or if they have demonstrated an ability to not only predict, but also look back in the past at positions of the planets along the zodiac. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this question. So for earlier materials, sometimes that accuracy is not so precise. In the case of the astronomical tables from the Greco-Roman period that I've been showing, they're actually quite accurate. So um, I've actually computed all these, all the information that we have. And in most cases, and especially for uh, the superior planets or the, the exterior planets, it's quite precise. Uh, you have sometimes a divergence of a few degrees, sometimes not more than five degrees. In the case of uh, especially Mars, um, you have uh, more divergence, but this has been happening until very recently that tables were not so accurate uh, for for some of the some some of the planets. But um, there is uh, a very high degree of accuracy in the case of of these tables. Um, what I was highlighting, especially for the for the earlier material, is that. Um, even if there is this accuracy, we shouldn't put the focus there uh, and we should uh, look at, at the wider context. And even in the case, for example, of, of Ptolemy, uh, when we look at, uh, at his materials in the, in the Almagest, sometimes there are not 
completely accurate and if they were actually contrasted with observations, they would notice that there's um, a divergence in the accuracy, but for what they needed to be used, the level of accuracy was enough. So even though they could see that it, there was a, a divergence there, we also need to keep in mind if something is good for what you need it, you might not need to, to change the system. And this would, of course, explain why the system of, of, of Ptolemy would uh, survive until later on, obviously being too weak, especially uh, in the Islamic world. But uh, I want, what I wanted to highlight is that we should keep an open mind there or rather than an open mind, we should try to see how these materials were used in their context and not according to our own standards of accuracy. But these tables are quite accurate, we have to say. I was wondering, uh, I'm sorry, I, I just had a quick follow up. Sure, of course, go ahead. Um, the reason was uh, uh, maybe nearly uh, 30 years ago when I was looking at this, I was wondering about um, this from the perspective of the Mithraic cults. And, and, and their star maps, which, you know, the Tauroctony, from the idea that Mithras may represent uh, the planet Venus. And, and you know, it, it may be this sort of cult esoteric concept of moving through the zodiac uh, rather than it being a constellation like the other figures. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the question then is, you know, looking back, can they predict this? And, and is this, is it possible to have something like this that is, uh, represents some sort of, uh, you know, religious, uh, spiritual and esoteric truth rather than, you know, a, a specific, you know, uh, astronomical chart, but. Well, yeah, I mean, definitely uh, astrology as the counterpart of astronomy in this period, they go hand in hand, is going to be then incorporated to, other disciplines that we could consider under the label of, of esoteric. Uh, medicine, for example, in this case, we wouldn't consider it esoteric, but astrological times are going to be relevant. So you're going to need to be able to identify the celestial configuration to be able to uh, perform particular medical procedures. Or in the case of alchemy, there's a, a long debate especially in these first centuries of, of the current era around the appropriate astrological time. So yeah, there, there's, it's, not so, it's not just an astronomical or astrological concern in itself, but it's going to have ramifications into many other, many other disciplines. I don't know if I'm answering your question with, with this. No, absolutely. Thank you very much for your patience and time. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, uh, could I, uh, I call upon Christian Torsa? Uh, Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Okay, because I'm not, I'm not seeing myself. But uh, well, uh, I just uh, wanted to thank you for this wonderful presentation. I, I think it was fascinating. Um, I'm I'm on on Greek uh, ast astrology, and I I wanted to ask a couple of quick questions uh, out of ignorance, perhaps. But but maybe maybe this can be interesting. I don't know. So um, first question question is why 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 uh, were was uh, why why were horse, uh, demotic horoscopes only written on on Ostraka? Um, so because uh, in, in Greek, I think you have both materials, but most of all, it's, it's uh, chunks of papyri. So I, I don't know if it's a, a question of material culture of, uh, of, of demotic uh, practice. So, so obviously, uh, Ostraka are small chunks and, and they, are, they can be useful for, for, for this kind of small text. But um, why not uh, chunks of papyri, right? Uh, I wonder if, if this says, can say something about the the, um, the context of astrological consultation. Uh, I don't know. And the other thing also related to that, and then excuse me if you have uh, touched on, on this already, um, but um, what is the time distribution, the chronological distribution of the Motic Ostraka? So is it something like 
Greek papyri, which you have mostly in second and third century. I mean, general, mm -hmm. not only astrological. So we can compare and say whether the presence of the first horoscopes in the Motic, uh is uh, uh, so, so can can mean a precise starting time for for horoscopes in in the Motic, or whether we don't know the same as as in the case of the Greek ones. Thank you. Um, so the first question, um, it's probably connected to chances of preservation uh, that we have mostly uh, horoscopes on Ostraca. Um, but some of the, the horoscopes that we have in Greek on papyrus are also these luxury uh, horoscopes. And we don't have any of those in, in the motifs. So perhaps some of these would have been written on papyrus. What we do have in the motif are many astrological treatises. So we do have astrological material, but in the form of treatises written on papyrus. Uh, for these horoscopes, there are mostly notes for the, for the astrologer. Basically, um, Ostraca might have been the, the most comfortable material to use in each particular context. Um, in, the, in the list that I gave, also you can see that we don't have so many horoscope so mainly the ones that have survived are the ones on Ostraca, which again are the ones that and are going to survive more easily because of the kind of investigating the january 6th capital attack detailed its findings and how okay um so it's it's easier for Ostraca to survive um so that might be that might be connected to we might discover at some point more developed uh, horoscopes in uh, on papyrus. Another thing that we have that is quite interesting in the Motic that Kim Brichol has been working on are astrological biographies. So biographies of people that then will be used as models probably to create the astrological treatises in, in which we have the date of birth of a person and then what happened to that particular individual throughout his life and then a compilation of these biographies will give a uh, certain uh, series of regularities that then will be used to com compose perhaps the astrological treatises. So we have these interesting materials uh, on the on the demotic side, but it's not a very satisfactory uh, answer, but consider that we don't have so many of these of these materials. In the case of a place like Athribis, we have an overwhelming amount of material on Ostraca and basically no papyri. <laughs> So that's, that's another issue there. There's this dump of, of Ostraca next to the temple that survived because Ostraca survived, but no papyri like in the case of Oxyrhynchus. Not that we have found, who knows? Inshallah, we'll find them in the, in the future, <laughs> who knows? Um, and so that was the, the first question. The second, could you please repeat the second question? <laughs> yeah, I'll try to be short, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Um, so if we know if we know the the time distribution, the chronological distribution oh, yeah, of, yeah, of yeah. the Matic Ostraca. So the ones that from Athribis are the earliest ones, and we we actually have uh, these Ostraca from the reign of Cleopatra the seventh are the the earliest ones, and they're earlier than any of the ones that we have also in Greek. So they're the earliest in in Egypt, and then uh, they go up to the, the second century, I think. I think that they don't go uh, beyond that point. And our Muthis ones are the, the latest, I think, that we that we have from Egypt. But again, some others might, might appear later on. Uh, from the second century are also some of these monumental ones that I've shown. So we have a ceiling in a in also in a threebies, in a tomb in which the horoscopes of the two people who are buried in this tomb are represented on the ceiling. And these are from, uh, I think it's 141 and 148 uh, CE. Thanks and very much. The... And um, you. You, one very quick thing, and this these astrological biographies which you mentioned, uh, are, are these materials published already by Kim Reholt or? I, I, I've only heard him talk about them at conferences, so I, I, I'm not sure if they're, if they're published. I think that they're not yet, but I, I might have missed the publication. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we had a, we have a, have a, have a question from, uh, from Virginia Berrocal. Uh, 
about the social background of the of the of, of the astrologers and of the people who make use of them of the of, the, of their knowledge uh what, what, how do we? And, and I'm 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 curious too. Actually, is there? I could could you? Is it possible to to draw any conclusions about similarities or differences between the 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 sort of social uh, zitzimleben of the demotic material as opposed to the Greek material? Or is it... so the the problem here is that in some case, in most cases, <laughs> uh, the horoscopes just don't have any reference to who the native is. Mm -hmm. In the case of Athribis, we do have the names. So there, there is a potential here in the, in the upcoming years of being able to identify a little bit more of who these people are, uh, just because we have so many more Ostraka. So once all these Ostraka are published, and especially the documentary texts, we have references to people with, uh, you know, references to perhaps what they do we might be able to identify who they are but it's really hard because mm -hmm. you don't get references to specific uh you know professions in some cases you do but not in the in the horse so, so for now we don't know an interesting thing here is that the ostracon that i've shown that has those three horoscopes all together uh they're all women so all those hor horoscopes correspond to to women so we have a uh, diversity of, of uh, not just men, but also women accessing. And these parallels the astrological handbooks that we have, in which some handbooks are only uh, about uh, women. So um, there were specific materials that, we have, that will be applied to them. But at this moment, it's, it's hard to tell. These people would go to the temple and um, it, it is possible that people across different classes uh, could access the materials and then, of course, they wouldn't be able to read, but the astrologer would deliver the results of what the astrological configurations would mean orally. So these would grant access to them to more people. But, um, you know, I could continue talking and yeah. speculating, but the, the evidence doesn't really provide us enough, enough material, unfortunately, at this point. Thank you. That's fascinating. I think I, we have time for maybe one more question from uh, and, and James Jacobs has been waiting uh, for some time to ask one. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank uh, you. Excellent information. <clears throat> I haven't talked all morning. Um, you started out with Navta Playa and I wanted to point out that the latitude there is very close to one fourth the distance from the equator to the pole it's not precise but we have these egyptian sites along the nile that have some very interesting latitudes and i'll click real quick on and post a, a link in chat there you go um to what extent are these records attached to place and are your findings of inaccuracy in relation to uh, comparative uh, considerations due to lack of understanding or lack of information on the observation position, because observation position can be so important in regard to accuracy, especially considerations of longitude. Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing that I haven't said or I haven't emphasized enough is that these tables that we have in the Demotic and also in Greek are mathematically calculated. So they're not based on observations. They uh, are derived from uh, algorithms that in some cases we have been able to identify. We can identify what the process is and some others uh, still not. For example, we have a lot of information for uh, for the moon and we know fairly well how they worked out the motion of the of the moon in the case of all the planets is not is not possible but they don't derive from observation astronomy and alexander jones tends to say this that astronomy at this point is a daytime occupation it's not something that is done during the night but it's actually something that is done through calculations based on all these tables so the almanacs give us different positions and will be are ready to be used by the astrologers to check um, 
a particular position, a particular date, but we also have all the tables that allow us, all these kinematic tables that allow, allow us and them in particular to uh, map what the, the motion of a particular celestial body would be and with all its, its variations. But again, this, this is mathematically produced. They could be checked against observations, but uh, this doesn't seem to have happened very, very often because it was really not apparently necessary. We have very few references to actual observations during these, this whole period in Ptolemy registers some, some of them are historical, so references to observations recorded by other astronomers, but there's not a lot of uh, information about observations in particular for this period. It was basically a mathematical science at this point. So it's really kind of a, a, a generation or a centuries removed from the observations that would have been tied to place that created all of this. So the, all these tables are calculated for particular locations, and most of them just work with the, the location of Alexandria. In terms of latitude, though, um, for the kind of accuracy, and we go back to the issue of accuracy, the, the variations wouldn't be as huge. You would need to go to the very north and the very south to have like significant uh, distortion in the data. And in some cases, some of the tables are really not giving us such precise uh, information. So uh, it's not going to be to be relevant. Mm -hmm. So longitude might be very relevant if the information uh, is collected in Egypt versus uh, Mesopotamia. Oh yeah, and, and of course, uh, the, uh, what is brought from Mesopotamia, we know that uh, all those um, algorithms were adapted to be used in, in Egypt. So they're not just uh, transferring exactly what exists in Mesopotamia to, to Egypt. It's not just a copy uh, business. It's, it, it is uh, adapted and it is reflected upon. Yeah. Yeah, and as I mentioning that linked article, of course, uh, we have a bunch of known capitals at the exact same latitude as the ziggurat of Ur. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of that might have transferred to a place where they didn't have to concern themselves with the difference in latitude, only with the difference in longitude. Perhaps. And I mean, astrologically, the place was relevant in, in, the, in these horoscopes from Athribis. We have not just the name of the native, but also the, the place where the birth of the native had, had taken place. Um, so the, there was some importance given to, to the place where someone had, had been born. Yeah, and, and my focus is on accurate astronomy. So place is highly relevant as compared to doing astrology. Uh, with tables that have been developed accurately by astronomy. But Thank keep you. in mind that these people were basically the same people. It was not just yeah. astronomers and astrologers. These were uh, the same people making the tables, using the tables, and then uh, applying them to what we call astrology. Yes, and, and of yeah. course, <laughs> if we, we can't go back to... Uh, see who these people were when all of this was developed initially because we don't have the documentation. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it has to be based upon some very accurate astronomy to have developed uh, to the point where we have the records and uh, place can be useful evidence uh, regarding finding where this all developed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we, we should we should thank Marina again for a wonderful talk and for an answering the and answering all these all these questions fantastically well and uh, uh, really really enjoyed that. And I, I want also to thank all of you for coming uh, and for sharing your ideas. I think this first uh, for us for for me for Kata and for Arpa this this first uh, year of the Graeco Egyptiaka lectures has been uh, 
has been very successful. We're very happy with it, and it's really, really fulfilled all the all the hopes we had. And we're very much looking forward to uh, to picking up the threads next autumn uh, with further talks and with with some uh, hopefully with some some some, some research work. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, to to seeing you all then. Um, and thanks very much again to everyone. Uh, but goodbye for now. Thank you.